going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. In 2015, Modern Care wanted a way to reach out to our online community of supporters and patients and connect them with information that they could use in their own communities. So we started this webinar series called Modern Care On Air, and we sought volunteers from the medical field to participate in these presentations. Joining us today for our third presentation is Dr. Alicia Gabriel. She completed her medical degree at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland, and is currently completing her residency in pediatrics at the London Children's Hospital at the University of Western Ontario. Dr. Gabriel is also the recipient of a Rhodes Scholarship and recently finished her Master's of Public Health at Oxford University. Dr. Gabriel has a special interest in global health, neonatology, and bioethics, and has done medical mission work in Honduras. There will be time for question and answers at the end of her presentation. So presenting today on breastfeeding, Dr. Gabriel, welcome. Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone for attending, and thank you for having me. This is such a great opportunity, and uh, this has, is actually my first webinar. So I'm really excited to uh, be here and to be able to talk to you today about um, something that's very important, especially in the field of work that I do, uh, which as Jen said is pediatrics. Um, so I thought uh, this would be a good topic. I think, um, you know, it's something I tried to do a presentation that's applicable to, to everybody, so not just really medical professionals, but I try to kind of make it educational for a broad range of populations. Um, so basically, just uh, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so first thing what we're going to talk about is um, really look at the anatomy and the physiology of the breast and also how the breasts produce milk. So it's a pretty awesome, awesome um, process. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the medical part of that. Um, also going to tell you a little bit about how milk is produced and um, some of the benefits that have been studied about breastfeeding. Um, we'll also kind of give you some information or tips about how uh, we typically start uh, babies on, on breastfeeding and also how to support moms who are breastfeeding. And uh, also want to go into maybe some ways that we assess how well babies are feeding. And then I have a few tips at the end for troubleshooting, uh, practical advice, and then just some resources um, for if you want to learn more or um, different educational websites uh, that I found that were really good um, resources. Uh, so before I start, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the um, American Academy of Pediatrics Breastfeeding Initiative. So they have all sorts of great resources for medical professionals. Uh, specifically for uh, a lecture like this, and they kind of help us to be able to um, give a lecture to a broad range of populations. So I just wanted to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics. Okay, so let's get started with the anatomy of the breast. So as you can see uh, here, this is uh, the inside of a breast. So Let's just kind of go through the process about um, what's inside a breast and how it works to produce milk. Um, so you can see there that there's an arrow pointing to what's called an alveoli. Uh, the alveoli are a group of what are called glandular cells, and they are the cells um, inside the breast that actually produce milk. Uh, surrounding these cells are called... Um, fat and connective tissue cells, or in, other, in a more medical term, myoepithelial cells. So you can see the, uh, the arrow pointing to those cells. Uh, so those surround the alveoli, which are the milk-producing cells. Um, so as you can see, the alveoli, they lead to ducts, and uh, the, ducts, the ductules lead to larger ducts, and uh, that's how the breast milk is expressed. Through the, through the alveoli to uh, the baby. Uh, so uh, the glands and the glandular tissue, which is the alveoli, these go through, um, they get larger during puberty and also during pregnancy. Um, and uh, actually the ratio of the alveoli, which are the glandular tissues that produce milk to the 
uh, fat and connective tissue increases uh, by two to one when a mother is breastfeeding. So they uh, get quite, they get much larger. So there's and much more of them. Um, so uh, interestingly, um, many people don't realize that um, much of the size of the breast in non-lactating women is actually due to the supporting structures, so the fat and connective tissue, and not the actual alveoli. Uh, so the actual size of uh, a woman's breast doesn't actually determine uh, how well they can produce um, or how much milk they can produce. So the, the size is mainly limited to the fat and connective tissue. Um, interestingly, uh, all mothers can store different amounts of milk depending on the size of their breast, but they did studies that uh, looked at women and uh, uh, women of all different size breasts, they produce the same amount of milk um, over a 24-hour period, and that was a, that was a, a average of about 800 mil. So that's quite a lot, and so breast size doesn't really affect the way uh, whether a mother can produce milk or not. Um, so, uh, as I said before, uh, the, the alveoli, the milk producing cells are, are surrounded by fat and connected tissue, and the, the fat and connected tissue are surrounded by uh, blood vessels, and the blood vessels are what bring all of the nutrients into the breast so that the breast can produce milk. Um, and so, just moving on to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about how hormones work in breastfeeding. Um, and how they regulate um, how a, a, a woman produces breast milk. So um, one of the very important structures in breastfeeding is in the brain, and it's called the pituitary gland. So it's a small gland in the brain that produces hormones. And the, the two large hormones that are um, important in breastfeeding are called prolactin and oxytocin. Um, so Basically, the, these are the two hormones that are very important for, for producing uh, bre uh, breast milk. So uh, we'll start with prolactin. So prolactin um, uh, starts to increase as the mother delivers her placenta. Um, and the prolactin raises as the infant starts to nurse on the breast. So there are nerve endings in the end of the breast, which actually send a single t signal to the mother's brain and they result in the release of prolactin from the pituitary gland as well as oxytocin. So uh, prolactin uh, surges after the mother delivers her placenta and it affects the alveolar tissue of the breast, which we learned about in the past slide. So prolactin acts on those milk-producing ducts. Um, and uh, as, as prolactin is released, uh, the milk producing ducts start to produce milk. Um, so moving on to oxytocin. So oxytocin again is released from the pituitary gland in the mother's brain. So, um, and another name for this hormone is called the love hormone. So if you've heard of oxytocin before, it's, uh, it's also a bonding hormone. So um, oxytocin has multiple effects. The first effect is it, it creates attachment, feelings of attachment and bonding uh, between a mother and her, nur her nursing infant. Um, the other thing that it does is, as we learned in the previous slide, it um, causes the connective tissue, the fatty tissue around the alveoli to contract, which expresses the milk um, from the breast. So, so the pituitary gland helps to produce the milk, and the oxytocin hormone helps to bond the mother and the infant, and as well helps to express the milk. So this expression of milk is called the letdown, um, commonly referred to as the letdown. In medical terms, we call it the milk ejection reflex, but it's also controlled by the baby uh, nursing at the mother's breast, or even um, can be released if the mother is thinking about her baby, or um, here's another baby cry. It's a very um, strong hormone, and uh, mothers, the milk reflex can be uh, triggered just uh, through thinking. It's, it's an amazing thing how our brain works. Um, the other thing to note is that the uh, hormone oxytocin can be inhibited by stress or anxiety. So sometimes when mothers are under a lot of stress or worried or have gone through a very difficult delivery, um, this hormone is actually um, blocked in our brain. So that's one thing that's 
you know, can uh, impede um, a mother nursing well. Um, another thing that the, the last thing that the oxytocin does is it causes the mother's uterus to contract. So um, as the mother starts nursing her infant, uh, her uterus contracts and it decreases the amount of bleeding after birth. So oxytocin and prolactin work together um, in a very uh, intricate cycle uh, involving the brain, uh, the bloodstream, and the, and the breast tissue uh, to produce, to help uh, with the production of milk. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so we'll just go through a little bit about the different types of human milk because there are more than one type and uh, what is in them and, and when we can see them uh, in a nursing mother after birth. So the, the first stage of milk is called colostrum. Colostrum is another word for it you probably heard is um, liquid gold. So this is the um, liquid gold that a mother produces right after birth. So it's the earliest stage of birth and it's actually started to be produced by the 16th week of pregnancy and it's ready at the baby's birth. Um, and colostrum continues to be present in the first few days after delivery. Um, colostrum is, is, the reason they call it liquid gold is it's very high in a lot of very good things for a baby. So the first thing is immunoglobulins and these are um, parts of the mother's immune system that are transferred to her baby that help to kickstart her immune system and to pass on some protection from her immune system. Um, uh, other things are it has uh, a lot of protein in it um, and a lot of um, uh, easily digestible um, uh, sugars and fats that are very good for the baby and high in nutrients. Um, the thing is, is that when a baby comes out of the mother's uh, of the mother's womb, uh, he's not he or her is not eating during uh, in utero. He, they're getting all their nutrients nutrients through the blood. So their stomachs are very small, so they can't really hold a lot of um, a lot of food yet. We have to stretch their stomach. So colostrum is, is very like uh, a lot of bang for your buck. So uh, there's, uh, it's, uh, you know, only produces five to seven mils per feed, which is, you know, um, barely a teaspoon, but um, that's how much a baby's stomach can hold at that time. So it, it kind of matches perfectly. And then as the baby gets older, uh, as days go by, the stomach increases in size and the milk changes. Um, so this is the first uh, a type of uh, milk and it's the, probably the most important. And um, it's so important that we've termed it the, the infant's first immunization. So it, it really um, gives the infant a lot of immunoprotection and it's very important. Um, so the next phase of milk is called transitional milk. Uh, so this milk occurs uh, anytime between two to five days postpartum and anywhere up to 10 to 14 days. Um, and at this time, the transitional milk is a transition from the colostrum to the um, completely full milk. So, um, you know, the mother's milk production at this time starts to increase. So the mother should see a increased volume of milk, and it should change from a thick, very like almost liquid gold consistency to a thinner, uh, more copious and creamy appearing transitional milk. And uh, as this transition occurs, uh, there's less immunoglobulin um, and increases in the in the in the fat and protein and lactose. So it transitions from the colostrum to uh, more of a milk-based consistency. Uh, it's good to know at this time, as the milk is transitioning, um, the mother can experience some tenderness and, and swelling in the breast as, as the breasts accommodate uh, to, to um, hold the transitional milk and to produce the full um, type of milk. So this is kind of the middle ground. And then um, as, as the volume of milk availability increases, the baby's stomach uh, also expands to be able to take more volumes of milk. So, uh, you know, the two kind of work together. Nature really helps in uh, supporting babies as their stomachs grow. Uh, the last uh, phase of milk is called uh, mature milk. And this uh, mature milk is developed uh, 10 to 14 days after delivery. So, uh, 
as the volume increases, so as there's more of it, the consistency is thinner. So um, at this uh, stage, some mothers perceive that their milk isn't good anymore because it, it's kind of the consistency of skim milk, but that actually is not true. This is the mature milk that it, um, the transition has happened, and it, um, because of the texture is different, um, some mothers think that it's not as nutritious, but this isn't true. Um, as mature milk comes in, uh, there are two types of milk um, that um, that are in the breast as the infant feeds. So um, you probably heard before at the beginning of the feed, it's uh, it's called the four milk, and this milk is very high in protein, it's high in lactose, and it's high in water. And then towards the end of the feed, uh, the the uh, milk becomes thicker and it has a lot more fat. So um, even within one feed, there are two different types of milk, the four milk and the hind milk. Um, so in one feed, which is, um, so it's pr providing all of the nutrients that the baby needs. Um, so that's, that's the final stage uh, of milk, of human milk. And um, at this point, sometimes mothers notice that their breasts are not as hard as not as um, tender because the consistency uh, is not, it changes with the mature milk. So um, now I'm just going to go into some benefits of breastfeeding. So um, there are many, many, many benefits of breastfeeding. So I'll kind of break it down into benefits for the baby and as well as benefits for the mother. So really um, the benefits um, greatly, greatly outweigh um, the downsides of breastfeeding. So it's important that people know all of the um, benefits of breastfeeding. And there have been many studies done to show um, all of these benefits and they're approved and backed up by a uh, quite a lot of good quality evidence. Um, so first of all, um, breastfeeding should be uh, viewed as the natural extension of nurturing and, and nourishing that a mother provides for a growing fetus. Um, and during the pregnancy, the breasts prepare themselves to feed and nourish their young infants. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, breast milk is really like the, the natural organic and our society, you know, is very um, interested nowadays in organic everything. And really breast milk is the most organic food that you can get, uh, especially for babies. There are no additives. There's no processing. And each mother's milk is custom designed for their own baby. And it's a really amazing, amazing thing. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, human milk is, provides a lot of compounds that are not able to be replicated in human formula. So um, there, are many, there are many, like I was saying with the colostrum, and many um, protective things for the baby. And also um, just the way the milk is constituted is very easily digestible. And uh, the mother's milk changes to meet their infant's uh, nutritional demands. It also um, has a lot of growth hormones and uh, growth factors that help the baby grow and develop. Um, and lastly, as I told you before with the oxytocin, it really um, helps with the bonding between uh, a mother and their baby, which is such a beautiful thing. And, um, and it's a beautiful experience for both mother and baby. Uh, some other benefits, so uh, there are quite a few immune benefits uh, with breast milk. So as I said before, the colostrum, uh, really there's been a lot of factors identified in human milk that provide important immune benefits for babies. And uh, these are not found in formula. So there are some um, immunoglobulin, like immunoglobulin type A, and other types of cells and uh, called lysosomes and lactoferrin that help prevent infection in the baby. Um, and uh, uh, these are very important to help jumpstart the baby's immune system, and uh, they're only found in the breast milk. And um, also, the mother produces, um, gives some of her immunity to her baby when she breastfeeds. So this is a very uh, important thing that we have uh, studied recently and found that really, really helps uh, babies uh, with developing their immune system. Uh, so other things uh, for moms, so there's a lot of, sorry, um, there's a lot of, before I go to mom, there are a lot of things that breastfeeding prevents. So this is just a list of some of the things that it prevents. 
Um, this is a report that was published by the Agency for Healthcare Research, um, and these are just some of the things that they um, they demonstrated that uh, breastfeeding decreases the risk. So otitis media is ear infections. Gastroenteritis is is a is a virus that babies can get that can cause them to vomit and have diarrhea and become very dehydrated. Uh, respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia. Uh, atopic dermatitis is eczema. So um, lower incidence of eczema as well as asthma. It also decreases the incidence of obesity as well as type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, childhood leukemia, sudden infant death syndrome, and uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a very serious, very serious um, condition that affects preterm infants. So um, there's been a lot of studies done on this, and, and you know, these are just um, a list of the most common things that uh, breastfeeding helps to prevent. Uh, so breastfeeding and obesity. So there have been uh, a large-scale study published by Lawrence Grimmer Strawn, and he demonstrated that uh, breastfeeding is protective against childhood obesity, and childhood obesity is becoming a very big problem in our society. Um, and so this study showed that uh, breastfeeding has a dose-dependent effect on obesity such that the longer that a mom breastfeeds, the greater the protection against obesity in their child. So that's a very uh, another benefit of breastfeeding. In terms of uh, benefits for the baby's brain, breastfeeding is really um, beneficial for the development of a baby's brain. Um, so uh, human milk, uh, the human infant brain goes undergoes its most rapid uh, complex growth during the last trimester trimester of pregnancy up to two years. So during this child, the neurodevelopmental uh, uh, kind of progress of the child is highly dependent on dietary intake of essential nutrients. And uh, the important nutrients uh, for development of infant brain growth are fatty acids, nucleotides, and oligosaccharides, and taurine. So these are all just different types of protein that help uh, the brain to grow, and um, all of these things are found in breast milk. Um, and there's uh, also um, uh, fats in the breast milk. Uh, you've probably heard about omega fatty acids um, that are found in the breast milk um, and uh, are very important for brain development in babies. Um, and also important, uh, the fatty acids help with uh, vision and sensory perception in infants. So. Uh, in, in addition to all of the other benefits, it also helps um, infants' brains grow and develop well. So there are many, many, many benefits. Um, so in terms of benefits for other types of babies, so um, now we're seeing a, an increased incidence in premature infants, uh, premature birth, and breast uh, feeding is very beneficial for premature infants. Uh, as you can see, lower rates of infection, lower rates of uh, necrotizing intercolitis, very um, uh, uh, serious um, conditions of the eyes that babies get with prematurity, uh, as well as helps regulate blood pressure. Um, so there are a lot of benefits as well for premature infants uh, who are breastfeeding. Uh, now getting to some of the uh, benefits for mom, because it doesn't only benefit baby, it also benefits mom. Uh, so there have been studies done that show that actually um, mothers who breastfeed are at uh, decreased risk of excessive uh, bleeding postpartum. And um, as we know, in in uh, developing countries, postpartum hemorrhage is one of the leading causes of death um, in uh, mothers. So, uh, you know, breastfeeding decreases this risk. Um, also... Uh, and we talked about before how this works, the oxytocin, which is produced in the brain, helps to contract the uterus so that uh, the blood vessels contract and there's no more bleeding. Um, also, uh, there are uh, studies which show that uh, there's a decreased risk of osteoporosis as well as ovarian and breast cancer, which is dose-related, um, and also helps with child spacing and uh, natural reproductive uh, methods with breastfeeding. So breastfeeding also helps with uh, child spacing. Um, just to go a little bit more into some of the benefits for mothers. So um, there is a dose-dependent relationship, which means the longer you breastfeed for, the 
uh, better it is to reduce your risk of some of these things. So type D2 diabetes, you can see each year you breastfeed, there's a 4 to 12% risk uh, to uh, not have gestational diabetes. Also, it decreases your risk of breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer, um, as well as postpartum depression. So really a lot of, a lot of benefits for the mother and the baby uh, for breastfeeding. Um, so just now, I'm going to go into a, some practical advice about um, mums who are breastfeeding um, and just general um, kind of diet and um, what they should be eating when they're breastfeeding. So um, it's important that mothers develop healthy eating habits um, while they're breastfeeding, um, should have a generally healthy diet. Um, Women should drink uh, to thirst when they're thirsty because they need extra fluid to produce the breast milk. Um, and uh, also, uh, mothers need to take in adequate protein because, as we said before, protein is very important for the development of uh, baby's brain. The other thing is calcium and vitamin D are very important for baby's bones, so it's good to take uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements if you don't live in a place where there's a lot of sun. Um, the other thing that's recommended is 200 to 300 milligrams of the omega-3 fatty acids to take, as well as um, a mineral or vitamin supplement. Uh, the other thing is that um, uh, additional four to 500 calories a day is recommended um, to make for a woman to produce about uh, 750 mils of breast milk. Uh, it it uh, approximately expends 630 calories. So. In addition, it also helps um, for moms to lose some of the post the postpartum weight. So really, it's um, it's really an all win win for breastfeeding. So yeah, uh, but you also have to do supplement um, some calories just to make sure that you're getting enough uh, to produce enough milk. Um, so just in terms of some practices that we recommend for initiating breastfeeding. So the American Academy of Pediatrics in, uh, recommends that breastfeeding be initiated within the first hour of life. Um, and they, they recommend the, fee the first feed should take place within an hour after delivery if possible. Obviously, this isn't always possible, but um, in most cases, cases um, it is, and it should be initiated as soon as possible. Uh, the mother should be placed skin to skin immediately after delivery to increase the bonding and also increase the production of oxytocin, as we talked about before, the love hormone. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, they recommend to uh, reduce any kind of suctioning around the infant's mouth as well as any traumatic procedures until after the first feeding. If there's anything, any blood work or, um, you know, babies obviously require um, a needle at first and some ointment on their eyes, but they recommend delaying this until after the first feed so the mother and the child can have that first bonding experience. Um, so in terms of, I, I mentioned before, skin to skin. So skin to skin is, is recommended for all babies right after delivery so that the mom and the, and the baby um, can, can bond and also the infants are hardwired to feed. So they have a set of reflexes um, that they naturally latch onto the breast once they're put close to it. So um, if an infant is placed skin to skin right after delivery, they can often, uh, the oxytocin levels are high after delivery, so often the infant can re uh, reach the breast themselves and latch with little or no assistance. And this really helps to facilitate the breastfeeding process. Um, and also, uh, because the oxytocin levels are so high, this encourages that letdown reflex um, so the milk is ready for the baby to take right away. And there are studies that show that um, infants who have skin to skin uh, right away, um, the infants interact and bond better with their mothers. They also are better at regulating their temperature and also have been shown to cry less and are less fussy and are also likely to feed for breastfeed for longer. So uh, this is a very important thing that you know, we as physicians sometimes don't put enough emphasis on and it's just this initial bonding and also trying to promote the natural um, instinct of a baby, which is to find their mother's breast, and that's done through the skin-to-skin -skin initiation. Um, so that's quite important. 
Um, so in terms of what we look for in babies, so um, for babies, we encourage um, in the beginning anywhere from 8 to 12 feeds per day, but every baby is different. But the important thing is to, we want to make sure that um, the, each time a baby feeds, it stimulates the mother to produce more milk, and we want to make sure that the mother's producing milk. So in order to um, get that cycle started, we recommend 8 to 12 feeds per day, um, and uh, that's usually about every two to three hours. Um, but some some infant feed is often as one to two hours, and uh, we you know we recommend that feeding um, should continue and should shouldn't be timed. They should be the infant should be fed on demand at first, um, so you're meeting your infant's um, nutritional needs, and they usually will cue you when they want to uh, when they want to feed. Um, so that's really some of the recommendations. Uh, another thing we recommend is that. Uh, allow the infant to nurse on one side fully because as we, we talked about before, there are the two types of milk, the uh, two types of milk. So if you nurse on the one breast and the, and finish uh, the feed on the one breast, it ensures that the baby gets both types of milk and all of the nutrients. Um, the other thing is is that um, studies have shown that prolactin levels, so that's the milk producing hormone, they peak uh, at night, so that's uh, another reason why we encourage uh, mothers to feed overnight to encourage milk production, uh, especially in the first month or two. Although it can be very tiring, <laughs> but it is worth it. Um, so just a little bit about um, how infants are, you know, uh, created to um, uh, latch and and um, and and find their mother's breast and how, how, how they've been created um, and how all their anatomy is created so that they uh, can breastfeed well. So um, a baby, uh, as you can see the baby here, so has a hard palate and a soft palate, tongue and larynx. So all of these things work together so that the baby can latch to the breast, um, create a seal, and um, and express the breast milk from the mother's breast and swallow, breathe, and suck at the same time. So it's quite a, a big job. So we say babies, are, their only job is, is really to eat, sleep, and poop. And that's actually quite a big job for them at the beginning. It, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of coordination. Um, but uh, this is just uh, a little bit about how um, a baby's mouth attaches to, to the uh, breast. Some, uh, some cues that we say to look for for babies um, is uh, so they do sometimes will do sucking noises or sucking um, movements. You can hear them licking their lips, and sometimes they move their head from side to side, or you see them kind of eat, starting to eat their hands. These are all cues that the baby is ready to feed, and and uh, so when when you get to know your infant more, you'll be able to see their cues um, and know the cues of when they're starting to get hungry. Um, so just some of the reflexes that uh, occur. So uh, there is a, a reflex that a baby has that once um, the baby is close to the mother's chest and the lower lip comes in contact with the um, nipple, the, the infant will automatically open their mouth wide. And at this time, uh, this is uh, the prime time to attach the baby uh, to the breast. Um, so this is a reflex that uh, all babies are created with, and uh, they open their mouth, and at that point, that is the optimal time to um, place uh, the areola inside the baby's mouth. Um, and so to ensure a proper latch, you want to see, as you can see in this picture, the baby's mouth is wide open, and you can see the, the lower lip is curled outward, and uh, and uh, you can see in the picture that the nipple is at the at the junction of the soft and the hard palate. So um, this is an important um, important um, skill to learn because uh, ha infants latching on the breast is very important to to promote good breastfeeding and to try to avoid any um, trauma to the nipples that the mother might uh, experience. So. Uh, these are just some of the um, basics about how babies latch to the breast. So in terms of positions, so there are many positions um, that um, babies can breastfeed in. The most important part uh, about positioning your baby is that the mother is comfortable because um, uh, 
the mother needs to be comfortable for the entire feed and if she's not comfortable then the feed won't go well so this is one thing that we say make sure the mom is comfortable moms make sure you're comfortable when you're breastfeeding uh, do whatever you need if you need a pillow if you have a special chair this is really the key part to uh, breastfeeding um, and it's also important uh, that the infant's head as you can see in this picture is straight in line with the body so you want to see a straight line from the head to the feet um, and as you can see, you want the baby's tummy to mom's tummy or the baby's chest to mom's chest. So you want to make sure that that's, no matter which position you use, those are the three main principles uh, to promote good breastfeeding. Uh, there's no right or wrong position. It's the best position is the position that mom is comfortable in and then the baby likes. So I'm just going to go through a couple of positions um, that we uh, recommend for moms to try. Uh, so the first position is the cradle position. Uh, so that's the one on the left. The cradle position is really a traditional position that uh, we kind of see um, uh, depicted when mothers are breastfeeding. Um, this position can be used sitting sitting in a rocking chair or in a semi uh, reclined seat. And uh, the newborn is is a position so that the chest faces the mother's chest. Um, so this is a an easy position and it's mainly for kind of sitting at a reclined and a reclining chair. The second position is the side lying position. Um, and this is uh, really for nighttime feedings or to allow the mother to rest. It's also an, a useful position for cesarean sections. Um, if, if you have a lot of pain around the incision site, uh, the baby can be supported by placing a pillow behind the baby's back, as you can see in the picture. Um, and uh, the mother can either hug the baby to her chest or um, simply roll the, the, uh, the, her body forward to meet the baby until the baby can latch on the chest. Uh, the last position or there's, uh, is called the, the cross cradle uh, position. Uh, so this slide, you can see the cross cradle position. And uh, this position is good because it provides more support to the infant's back and neck. Um, it's, it's more useful for the newborn infant to smaller infants. As infants get larger, it gets harder to maintain. Um, but you can see how the infant is held by the um, mom's opposite hand and arm instead of on the same side as the breast that's being offered. Uh, and the last position um, is the cradle or the football position. Um, this is another good position for uh, mothers who have had cesarean sections. As you can see, it keeps the baby off of the, the mother's abdomen, and it's uh, useful that way, and uh, and uh, can help if if there's a if there's a lot of pain around the incision site. So this is another, and also good for resting it in bed. Um, so uh, these are all different positions. There's no right or wrong one. It's just the most comfortable for you, and these are just some. Um, um, ideas or examples of, of different ways that can help to facilitate breastfeeding. Um, so just a couple of reasons. Um, a lot of questions I get is, um, you know, what are the reasons that mothers should not breastfeed? Uh, there are not very many reasons, and the reasons for not breastfeeding are, are quite um, serious reasons, and these are really the only reasons that I would ever tell a woman not to breastfeed, and even sometimes there are exceptions to this rule. So HIV infection is one that we recommend not to breastfeed. Uh, certain types of viruses, um, if there's any history of, of drug use or alcohol abuse, um, active untreated tuberculosis, and then certain medications, um, chemotherapy medications are very uh, strong medications that are not compatible with babies. Um, the other thing is undergoing radiation therapy. Another thing is active, untreated varicella, which is chicken pox. So this is only recommended when mothers have active chicken pox themselves. Um, and the last thing is if there are any active herpes simplex. So these are kind of the cold sore lesions around the breast. So those are really the only reasons why a mother should um, should not breastfeed. Anything else, there's no other contraindications to breastfeeding. Um, so at times there are some indications for um, giving babies other um, supplements besides just breast milk, and that usually comes in the form of formula or sometimes IV fluid. So these are really the only reasons why a baby should need something other than breast milk until the ages of six months old. So 
Um, premature infants sometimes need the extra calories um, or sometimes need IV fluids. Uh, babies who have uh, low, low sugars at birth, um, if the mother is very, very, very ill. Um, some, there are some rare inborn errors of metabolism, and as well as if the baby is uh, acutely dehydrated um, or if the mother's on a medication that does, is incompatible with breastfeeding, this last slide that I showed you. So these are really the only reasons that babies should need anything extra besides their mother's breast milk. Um, so last couple of slides, so just going into a little bit about what I look for as a pediatrician um, when uh, I'm assessing newborn babies. So um, weight loss, so a lot of the time um, all newborns are expected to lose some weight early in life. They have a lot of excess fluid. And so um, the average loss is about 6% over the first three to four days. Um, and a baby is expected to gain their birth weight back in uh, two weeks. Um, anything that's greater than 10%, uh, baby should be seen by uh, a pediatrician and their family doctor just to assess um, how breastfeeding is going and if there are problems um, that need that are not allowing the baby to get enough milk. Um, so in terms of weight gain, usually it begins around day four to five and you expect um, 15 to 30 grams. I usually tell patients every day except for Sunday. So they get a break day, but that's what you would expect in the first two to three months of life. Um, so some reasons for why babies uh, may not gain weight while they're breastfeeding. So if there's not enough milk supply um, coming in for uh, reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, so basically uh, what we do is we, we, one way we look to see how breastfeeding is going is first we'll weigh the infant and then we'll ask mom to breastfeed and then we'll weigh again. And we're able to um, calculate how much the baby's gotten by um, weighing before and after fees. Other things we do is we ask moms to come in and we evaluate how the infant is feeding and if there are any um, positions we need to correct with the latching. <coughs> and we also um, watch how the milk is flowing out and to see how often, we'll assess how often the mother's feeding and how long she's feeding just to make sure um, she's get, the baby's getting the full feed of both the types of milk. So these are just some ways um, that we assess the weight loss um, in our clinic. So in terms of um, what we expect to see babies, so I said babies' jobs are to eat, to sleep, and to poop. So uh, this is what we expect for babies. So um, usually we expect four to six um, uh, peas in their diaper by day four, and we like to see just clear Clear peas, no, just really kind of a yellow, normal color. The other thing is, is um, by the time day four comes around, we like to see three to four loose um, stools. Um, and they're usually kind of, uh, we call them mustard seed stools. So that's what we like to see in normal breastfed infants. All babies are different and not everyone's going to be the same, but these are just some things we look for um, to in the first month to, to evaluate how the feeding is going. So as I said before, um, these are just some of the things that we would evaluate in our clinic to see how the mother is feeding, how the latch is going, and and most of the time uh, we can troubleshoot, um, you know, 90% of breastfeeding difficulties with this list. So um, it's it's usually pretty simple. So just a couple of um, you know maternal trouble signs that I've come across, and just some you know tips that I've I've learned about how moms can, um, um, you know, mitigate some of these problems that might pop up when they're starting to breastfeed. So, you know, overall, breastfeeding should be a very um, pleasant thing for the mother and the baby. Um, and so pain during nursing is, is really a sign that uh, the latch technique should be evaluated. So in the first few days, the mother may um, feel some discomfort, but it shouldn't be um, it shouldn't last through the whole feed. Um, and so an improper latch can cause a lot of nipple pain. So usually once we correct the latch, that usually resolves the um, nipple pain that the mother 
is um, experiencing. But the thing is, is that um, um, they did surveys and most of the mothers who stopped breastfeeding prematurely, it was because of nipple pain. So it can be very distressing to parents um, and especially mothers uh, when uh, they're experiencing a lot of pain with feeding. Um, so some things that you can do to troubleshoot. So there are nipple shields. This is a little bit controversial um, as it, it's shown to decrease the milk supply, but a lot of mothers said that it's helped them to stop prevent them from stopping nursing prematurely. So nipple shields can be used judiciously. Other things, um, other tips would be um, to uh, use some Vaseline around the cracked nipples as well as um, expressing breast milk and kind of rubbing it on the nipples as it has the anti-inflammatory properties from the breast milk. Um, other um, things is that to air dry the nipples after feeds as well as to avoid wearing very tight, restrictive clothing. Um, so other things that can happen with breastfeeding is the engorgement. So sometimes if the milk doesn't come out properly, the nipples, so the breasts get very hard and engorged and it's quite painful. Um, so the key to this, to the engorgement, is to continue feeding regularly because sometimes what happens is um, the baby will go through a growth spurt and require more milk so, so the breast will become more engorged. So the real key to this problem is to continue regular feeds um, to remove the milk. And sometimes mothers have to use pumps to express the milk um, so to ensure that there's a good flow in their breast. Um, so these are just a few of the of the um, of uh, the troubleshooting tips that I've learned um, throughout my practice. So last couple of slides. So um, I did survey a few friends who are um, big breastfeeding advocates, and I asked them, you know, um, I'm giving a lecture. Can you give me some advice on what you would tell moms and families who are breastfeeding? And um, and uh, so uh, these are some of the these are some of the uh, um, advice that I got from from friends. So the first one is babies are uh, are versatile feeders. There's not one way to breastfeed. Um, make sure you have a lot of support. Uh, tell moms not to take, forget to take care of themselves. So those are kind of the three big messages that I got from uh, friends who are big breastfeeding advocates. Um, I have some practical resources here. Um, for a copy of the resources, just email um, info at modercare.org, and I'd be happy to share this PowerPoint. Um, and other things um, really that are important is uh, try to get in touch with knowledgeable physicians in your community who are breastfeeding advocates. There are lactation specialists at most hospitals. Um, you can be referred to their clinic. <clears throat> there are also a lot of hospital support groups. Um, the Lecce League International is a great resource for mothers as well as WIC programs. So these are, make sure that when you are breastfeeding, you really take advantage of all the supports in your community as the more support, the better. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a little uh, tips that I've gotten from friends. So it's also, um, you know, sometimes breastfeeding can be seen as uh, moms are a little bit stigmatized. And so it's good for um, those healthcare professionals out there to be um, cognizant of this and to really try to make, um, to advocate for breastfeeding and, and try to make their doctor's office breastfeeding friendly and and really try to um, encourage women to breastfeed as there are so many um, benefits to it as I express. So um, that's the end of my lecture. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope that that was um, useful for everyone. I'm happy to answer some questions um, before we finish. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel. I'll just let everyone know she came straight here from the ICU, so we're very happy to have her with us today. And we're going to open the floor now. We're going to turn this on to um, a Q&A mode. So All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask her a question live, or you can type in your question here on the left-hand side in the chat, and I can convey that to her. The first question um, Dr. Gabriel was asked earlier by Suzanne, she's from Mexico, and she wanted to know if you know of any resources for her that would be in Spanish. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I do not know any off the top of my head, 
but I will find some and uh, I will send them to uh, to you, Jen, and you can distribute them. I can definitely find some resources in Spanish, and that's a great point. Um, so definitely, I I will get those uh, to you as soon as possible. Yeah. So I'm just Suzanne. I'm just going to type the email for modern care here in the sidebar and if you want to email us I will get back to you with some resources from Dr. Gabriel yeah do you have any other questions um Stephanie Potter asks she said my baby has a tongue tie and he's growing well despite some difficult feeding at the start we talked with our midwives and have decided to wait for it to stretch out what's your experience with that yeah that's a great question Stephanie um, I didn't, um, I didn't mention tongue ties, um, but you know, that is something that we do, um, if we find that the, the baby is really not able to latch. So sometimes what can happen is, um, babies at the, at the bottom of their tongue, uh, you can see there's a little muscle. We all have it at the bottom of our tongues. And sometimes, uh, the baby's muscle prevents their tongue from, um, from, from moving and sometimes it restricts their ability to latch. Uh, so uh, there are times when we do recommend um, sometimes we can do a procedure and just clip that muscle to help uh, the tongue facilitate uh, latching. Um, but it is it is something that's assessed on a case by case basis, and obviously it is a medical procedure. Um, and usually it's kind of a last resort that we use. And if if you know the main thing we look at, as I said, is the weight. And if the baby is growing well. Um, that's really the main indicator that things are going well with the breastfeeding. So uh, I think uh, your your midwife was right to, to kind of wait things out and see how the growth goes, but it is a case by case basis. But I'm glad that you brought that up because that is an option because sometimes, you know, you can correct the latch and actually, um, you know, it doesn't get better. And, and that's at the point when we would consider looking at a, a tongue tire. Fren frenulotomy is the medical term for it. <laughs> She followed up. She said he's about 10 pounds at a month, so we're feeling confident. Great. Well, keep going. I encourage you, and that's very exciting. Babies are great. And <laughs> lots okay. of fun, but lots of work. <laughs> I, have, I have a question about mastitis. I have three girls, and I've nursed them all, but every time I nurse, I get mastitis in the same spot on the same breast. And I've kind of just conceded that this is just an inevitability for me. Is there a way to maybe lessen the chance of getting mastitis? Or is this just something that I am genetically predisposed to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so mastitis is, um, so it's uh, sometimes, it's, an, it's really, um, Itis, anything that ends with an itis is, um, means inflammation. So uh, it's really an inflammation of the part of the breast. Sometimes uh, it can be caused by um, a bacteria and sometimes not. It just depends. Um, but really, in terms of your question about the genetic predisposition, um, you know, all of our immune systems are very different. Um, but the fact that you get, you've had it with all of your babies, you know, some, some women are predisposed predisposed just because of the way of their anatomy of their breast. Um, but the main treatment really for mastitis, I'm sure that you've been told, is really, again, to continue um, the feeding as regularly as possible. And it, a lot of mothers say, you know, this doesn't make sense because I'm going to transmit the infection to my baby. But, um, you know, uh, because you, you also transmit all of your immune protection to the baby, um, the baby, you're both colonized with the same bug. So it it doesn't transmit the infection. And sometimes when the infection becomes an abscess and very serious, you need antibiotics. But the main actually stay of treatment is really feeding more often to try to, to resolve the inflammation. Because the inflammation really is a, once the milk um, isn't being expressed, it's not moving. And when, when fluid in the body stops moving, it, it, it starts to get inflamed. So it's it's hard to say if if you're predisposed, but I think you know the mainstay is really the to 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 continue feeding, and that sometimes seems counterintuitive, but um, and it, it's really unpleasant. And but did most of your mastitis resolve with the frequent feeding, or 
it, well, I was I was on antibiotics with two out of three of them. Um, yeah. But now by three, I kind of, I feel it coming on and I know that it's going to happen. So I, I'm almost ready for it. Um, okay. so, well, yeah, so that's one of the benefits of having it three times in a row. Um, yeah. we, have, we have another question here from Halifax. She says, um, what does Dr. Gabriel suggests in terms of how long, ideally, to breastfeed, some of the studies cited the mark of a year. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, we say a year is, is really the most optimal in terms of all of the benefits. Um, you know, six months is good. If you can only breastfeed to six months, like six months is better than nothing. Even any, you know, uh, amount of time of breastfeeding is better than nothing. But you're right that uh, the studies do recommend to 12 months. And actually, you know, you can breastfeed up to two years. Um, and there are just so many benefits that, you know, breastfeeding even up to two years, there's, there's really no downside. And, and um, as, I, as I said in my presentation, a lot of the benefits are accrued uh, over dose dependence. So the longer you breastfeed, the more likely uh, you and your child are to benefit from it. So they say 12 months, but honestly, I I tell my patients, you know, as long as they as they as you want to and they want to, there's no harm. But 12 months is really the optimal time that we recommend. Okay. Um, we have another question from Emily from Ontario. She said, "Can you request after delivery?" have that time to breastfeed your baby or do the nurses and doctor take the baby away for their shots and testing yeah so that, that's a good question Emily um, so uh, most uh, healthcare professionals do know about the skin to skin but I don't think there's any harm in you know because usually you get to meet with either your midwife or your obstetrician beforehand to kind of sit down with them and say you know, and to make sure that they do know about it. I don't think there is a harm in just to say, you know, um, I would prefer if, you know, there are some times, there are some medical indications where the baby is not doing well, where they do require, um, they need to be taken right away. And those are rare, but they do happen. But I think sitting down with your doctor, your midwife, um, uh, to kind of go through your expectations and that you would, you know, really like the benefit of early skin to skin. I don't think there's any harm in doing that. Although most um, healthcare professionals do know about the benefits of skin to skin and starting breastfeeding within an hour. Yeah, so I think Dr. Gabriel is saying you can sort of write that into your, your birth plan. So that way yourself and your support people, they know that this is something that you want after baby is born. And Elizabeth from Ontario commented, she works in a labor and delivery ward and they promote skin to skin one hour after birth. So I have, okay. found, yeah, I have found that it is more common. Um, I just had my youngest two years ago and they did skin to skin, not just with me, but also with my spouse. Yeah. Um, we actually, she didn't have, her, you know, a bath or, or anything like that right after she was born. She was really just with us. And so it was great for us both to be able to bond and it was very intimate. Yeah, no, it's really beautiful. And that's, that's a new, like, with spouses as well, it's a really nice, especially, it's a nice bonding experience, because if you think about it, the men don't really have that nine months to bond. So it's funny, because, you know, my favorite part of my job is when the baby comes out, like, and you just see a brand new baby just out of the womb. And sometimes, you know, you hand them to uh, the father, and you kind of see their face, and their body and their whole you know, aura just change and they realize, oh my goodness, like the child is here. They kind of, it's this eureka moment, you know, because they haven't had that nine months to bond like the mom. So I think the skin to skin with the, with the fathers is also a really um, wonderful practice too, that is, you know, is, it is, you know, they're encouraging that as well. So that I'm glad you brought that up, Jen. <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank Emily for that question because she told us her oh, due Emily. Her her due date is today. So. Oh, exciting! Oh my goodness. <laughs> now, any moment now. <laughs> oh my goodness! How exciting! Congratulations! Congratulations! And thank you for joining us for this. When you're yeah, on how day. exciting! Um, <laughs> another question. Um, this delay of weighing until after the first feed doesn't affect the accuracy of recording the birth weight, does it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so if you remember 
uh, the um, first milk, the colostrum milk that comes, so it's very small amounts, right? So five to seven mils, um, which is really like a, a, t a teaspoonful. So um, that that will affect the birth weight, but very minimally. So, but that's an excellent question. But um, the first feed is really more, obviously for the colostrum, like I was saying, the benefits of that, but it's really the first feed is for bonding and also to promote the infant's natural, um, you know, the way the infant was created to really naturally bond and latch to the breast. I think it's just to facilitate that and that helps uh, down the road to facilitate breastfeeding. But that's a really good question, but it really would affect the weight minimally. All right, are there any further questions before we wrap up here? Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Gabriel. This was a, a wonderful presentation and thank you to all the women who were able to join us today and yes. the, the yeah. new, soon to be moms. <laughs> uh, yes, it's so exciting. Thank you everyone for, for participating and thank you, Jen, for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions or further comments, you can email us at info at modercare.org. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.